Hey everyone, did you know that according to the 2020 Global Risk Reports, recently published by the World Economic Forum, that cyber attacks was ranked amongst the top 10 risks along with climate change, water crises, and biodiversity loss. Now that is from a global macro perspective, but from a micro business vantage point, can you guess what are some of the top concerns that are weighing heavily on the minds of the business leaders? Now, if you guess cyber attacks, then you are absolutely correct, along with one, the inability to attract and retain top talents, two, the inability to create new business models, and three, the inability to develop the next generation of leaders. Now, when we hear about these concerns, they usually translate to risk. For instance, by not having the top talents, an organization is at risk of becoming less innovative and less competitive. By not having the right business model, an organization is at risk of losing market share. And by not having the right leader, an organization is at risk of becoming less relevant that we saw with Yahoo, Blockbuster, as well as Kodak. Now the question is, what is risk? How do we identify, assess, and manage risk? So let's get started. The question is, what is risk? Now the answer or the definition may very slightly depending on the context and who you ask. But simply put, risk means potential loss, the probability of losing something of value. You can also frame risk in the sense, what can go wrong? How likely is it to go wrong? And if it does go wrong, what are the consequences? Now I know what you're thinking, Jimmy, this risk definition is way too simple. I need something more technical and security related, right? Well, you got it. Risk is a likelihood of a threat exploiting a vulnerability and the corresponding business impact. In other words, a higher a likelihood of a risk to occur and the higher the severity of the impact, then the higher the potential of a loss will be. Now, there are many different types of risk. There's the infrastructure, application, strategic, market, credit, liquidity, operational, as well as the legal risk. But more specifically to information or cybersecurity risk, there's the risk of compromising the confidentiality, the availability, as well as the integrity of the information or information systems. In other words, there's the risk of disclosing, altering, and destroying information that is at rest, in motion, or in use. Also, there's the risk of denying access to data and systems. Given all this risk, how do we even manage information or information system? Now, that depends on your organization's requirements, whether you're meeting any applicable regulatory, statutory or contractual obligations, you can use one or more of this risk management frameworks. Now I'm going to throw a couple of uh, acronyms that you hear. You can hear of COSO or you can hear of ISO and NISC. Now I'm going to focus mostly on the NISC risk management framework. It stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology. Now this framework is currently used in the uh, government entities to protect its IT systems. It is a very comprehensive, robust, as well as flexible framework that you can use to tailor to meet your organization's needs. Now, a framework is really a holistic, structured, and systematic way of identifying, assessing, managing, and rating risk. Now, with that, let me dive right into what this risk management framework is. NIST offers two different frameworks. So let's start first with the risk management framework, and then we can go into the cybersecurity framework. Risk management is complex and multifaceted process. It needs to be performed as a holistic organizational wide activity 
that addresses risk from the strategic level all the way to the tactical level, ensuring that risk-based decision is integrated into every aspect of the organization. To gain a holistic view, we start with the NIST Special Publication 839 to frame risk at three different tiers. The first tier is strategic, and it addresses risk from an organizational perspective. Senior leaders providing strategic vision, top-level goals, and objectives for the organization. At this level, we develop a comprehensive governance structure and an organization-wide risk management strategy. Moving down to Tier 2, it addresses risk from the mission and business process perspective and is guided by the risk decision at Tier 1. At this level, we are defining and prioritizing the core missions and business processes with respect to the goals and objectives of the organization. And finally, Tier 3, it is more technical. It addresses risk from an information system perspective and it is guided by the risk decisions at tiers one and two. For tier three, this is where the NIST Special Publication 837 Risk Management Framework comes into play. The Risk Management Framework, RMF, provides a disciplined and structured process for managing information system-related security risk that is consistent with the organization's missions and business objectives and overall risk strategy established by the senior leadership. The risk decisions at tiers one and two serve as inputs into the RMF and they drive the selection and deployment of security controls at the information system level. As you can see, the RMF security lifecycle has six steps, starting with the security categorization, moving to the security control selection, security control implementation, security control assessment, information system authorization, and finally, the security control monitoring. Now, before discussing each step in depth, I'd like to highlight that the RMF steps can be used for both new deployment and legacy information systems. For legacy systems, we use the first three steps to perform a gap analysis to determine if the necessary and sufficient security controls have been appropriately categorized, selected, and implemented. The last three steps are used to address any security control uh, weaknesses and deficiencies. The rest of this presentation will be focusing on new systems. With that, let's start with the security categorization. Categorize based on the adverse impact to organizational operations and assets with respect to the loss of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of systems and the information processed, stored, and transmitted. The results from this process influence the selection and prioritization of security controls for the information systems. Systems supporting the most critical and or sensitive operations and assets will demand the greatest level of attention and effort to ensure that appropriate information security and risk mitigations are achieved. This step should be integrated into the initiation, concept, and or requirement analysis phase of the SDLC. Select security controls. Select an initial set of baseline security controls for the system based on the security categorization. We can then tailor or supplement the security control baseline as needed to reduce risk to an acceptable level. Now you can use the FIPS 200 as well as the uh, Special Publication 853 to aid with this process. As shown here, the Special Publication 853 Revision 5 draft expands to 20 control families and north of 900 controls to address privacy, mobile, and cloud security risk. Implement security controls. Implement controls that are defined in the security and privacy plans and document in a baseline configuration detailing how the controls are used within the system and its environment of operation. This step should be integrated into the development phase of the SDLC. Assess security controls. Here we want to assess the controls to determine 
if the controls were implemented correctly, operating as intended, and producing the desired outcome. The results include recommendations for correcting any weaknesses or deficiencies in the controls. They are documented in the Security Assessment Report, also known as the SAR. The SAR is one of the three key documents in the security authorization package developed for authorizing officials. This step should be integrated into the development and or the integration and test phase of the SDLC. Now, you can use the Special Publication 853A to aid with this process. Authorization of system. Authorize information system to operate based on acceptable risk level. The security authorization package that we mentioned earlier contains one, the security plan, two, the SAR, and three, the plan of action and milestones, also known as POEMs. The information in these key documents is used by authorizing officials to make risk-based authorization decisions. After risk determination, an organization can respond to risk in a variety of ways, including one, accepting risk, two, avoiding risk, three, mitigating risk, four, sharing risk, five, transferring risk, and six, a combination of the above. Some risk may be of greater concern than others. In that case, more resources may be directed to address higher priority risks than lower ones. This step should be integrated into the implementation phase of the SDLC. Continuous monitoring. To maintain an ongoing situation awareness of the information system security posture, including assessing control effectiveness, documenting changes to the system, conducting security impact analysis to the changes, and reporting the security state of the system to designated organizational officials. This step should be integrated into the operation maintenance phase of the SDLC. The second NIST framework is the cybersecurity framework, also known as CSF. It was intended for adoption by the critical infrastructure sector. According to Gartner, CSF is now used by approximately 30% of U.S. private sector organizations and projected to reach 50% by the end of 2020. Since 2016, U.S. federal agencies referred CSF as a standard for managing and reducing cybersecurity risk. Industry is increasingly referring to CSF as a de facto cybersecurity standard. It is designed to be size, sector, and country agnostic. The framework comprises of five core functions, starting with identify. Here, the expectation is to develop an organizational understanding to managing cybersecurity risk to systems, people, assets, data, and capabilities. Moving to the protect function, it is to develop and implement appropriate safeguards to ensure delivery of critical services. The detect function is to develop and implement appropriate activities to identify the occurrence of a cybersecurity event. The respond function is to develop and implement appropriate activities to take action regarding detected cybersecurity incident. And finally, moving to the recover function, it is to develop and implement appropriate activities to maintain plans for resilience and to restore any capabilities or services that were impaired due to cybersecurity incident. There are 24 categories and 108 subcategories outcome-based security activities. The CSF is flexible and you can use any controls catalog to best meet your organizational needs. Now with that, I hope you have a better understanding of risk and risk management frameworks to help improve your company's security posture. Until next time, thank you so much for watching this video. Let's connect, collaborate, and make positive changes.